right, so here we go. We're going to talk about neuroscience and normalization. So let me tell you who I am. I'm a mom. I have two kids, as Karen mentioned. Devin is 16. She's actually a senior in high school. She's looking at colleges. And you can see she's a character in half. And this is my sweet little Dante. This is in Kazakhstan, where, where I adopted him. That's when he just lost his first tooth a couple months ago. <laughs> this is in Eddie Montessori School, where I'm a mentor, a Montessori teacher. So I was teaching in a primary classroom, and then I came into the role of a mentor teacher. So at that school, I worked with six, now there are, it's down to six, it was nine, children's house teachers, um, just to try and help them with authentic practices. It's a public school. Our population is about 65% gets free or reduced school lunch. Um, and there's a lot, it's a challenging, it's a challenging environment in Springfield. We've had um, murder behind the school. We've had armed robbery in front of the school. Um, there's, it's, it's challenging. But the kids, it's extraordinary what's happening there. I like to write. Does anybody get the public school Montessori and anybody read that? Raise your hand. And hooray! If you don't get it, it's free and it's not just for public school. So if you Google public school Montessori, um, they'll send you the paper for free. It comes up once a quarter and has good news to keep you connected with Montessori. Sorry. I run a tree learning. Um, and I'm in graduate school. And this is a picture from graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> so don't think too highly of those hard boys. Every year, <laughs> every year in December in finals week, they like to strip it off and run out their anxiety across campus. <laughs> so there you have it. So I'm studying um, my degrees in psychology with a focus on neuropsychology and neurobiology. And they just had a midterm Wednesday night, so I'm still a little sleepy, so I'm studying for that. Mm -hmm. But again, it was Dante that brought me back to that. But the more that I study it, the more that I'm seeing these incredible connections between Montessori and the findings from time research. And actually, because of that, I ended up as an advisory panel member for this course that the Annenberg Foundation is creating. Has anybody heard of the Annenberg Foundation? They are a philanthropic organization there, and one of their many um, initiatives is to create an entire undergraduate education online for free. Wow. So when they create a program, I believe you can buy credits through University of Colorado for like $60 per credit, which would be really affordable. When they create each module, for instance, uh, on physics or chemistry or neuroscience and education, they go to the leaders in that field to develop the materials. And for neuroscience and education, they went to Harvard. And I happened to be in the professor's class who they went to for that. And I asked a couple questions. And I ended up meeting with people. And I ended up getting appointed to this board. So this advisory panel has only one teacher on it. And it's creating courses for all teachers in education, right? Not just Montessorians. But the only teacher is in Montessori. <laughs> is that cool? <laughs> That's so cool. All right, so we're excited about that. This course. Um, this is the front page from it. And it's called Neuroscience in the Classroom. And it is going to be available at um, learner.org, www.learner.org, for free. And I just spoke with the producer yesterday. And it's scheduled um, to come out next month. So keep your eyes posted to that. It's exciting. And it's a good course. And in it, you're going to see two of the classrooms that I mentor which is very exciting. So they show Montessori classrooms as an example of excellence in education, the education that applies the principles of neuroscience to practice. So they feature, did you hear that? Harvard featured Montessori classrooms in their course on the best education. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> so we're making strides, right? Things are changing. Things are changing. And then, oh, this is the my presentation. Let's see. Hold on a second. Let me just make sure. Hold on. Oh, I so appreciate your patience. No, this isn't that one. I'm sorry. I deleted a slide which was an accidental. Maybe it wasn't accidental. Maybe it was my subconscious doing it. <laughs> um, the next slide was supposed to be exciting news for me. So here on this. Um, Um, 
they just reached out, they're creating another course on chemistry, and they just reached out to um, a professor of chemistry who I happen to know, who took me up in a hot air balloon last weekend and proposed to me. So that Aww. was <laughs>
physically what we witness them experience. Physically. So, you know, when you see someone yawn and you yawn, it's contagious, right? It's the same thing. When you see somebody doing something gorgeous, some, if you notice something in you, the same parts of your brain get activated. So when we say we're living vicariously, it's, we mean it. <laughs> we're actually living that's happening inside us. And that's why modeling is so important. The child's mind, right? Because we learn that way too. It's not just the little ones. It's us. It's us. So I call that the absorbent heart, right? Because that's how it works. And because we have that, optimism really matters in how we approach it, having a positive attitude. I love I saw Kitty. If you get to hear Kitty speak, if you didn't hear this morning, you should hear Kitty Bradley speak. She was saying this morning how, you know, we've got little, I forget the name, she's Isaiah, and he's a little maniac that day in the morning, right? But you don't go, go sit in that chair in the corner. You go, Isaiah, I'm sorry, you can't keep yourself still, so you're, you're hurting all the children in the classroom, but you just sit right here for a while and watch the other children positively, telling, setting a really clear boundary in a really positive way. Optimism matters. They've done research on this, and they find that children who are reared in environments that are surrounded by negativity, abusive environments, they can't pay attention to positive things in the future. They are naturally drawn to negative things. All right, now listen, if any of you will draw it up in some of that, that kind of environment, don't you worry, because the, the brain is plastic. We can change it all the time. But we have to make effort to change it. We can, but we have to make effort. So for our children, it's so important for us to be optimistic, to always put things in a positive light, because then they will be able to attend to positive things. Whereas if, if you're in those negative, abusive situations, you just can't, you just can't even go there. You're just drawn. You'll be in a room full of happy, happy, joy, joy, and there'll be one little jerk, and you'll be like a magnet for that little jerk. Right? Many of us have had relationships like that. <laughs> that's where, yeah, that's a lot. Where you can let them So in our classrooms, we want to make sure that we allow relationships because we learn through relationships, and we, we need them to be positive relationships, optimistic, and that comes back to grace and courtesy. So everything comes back to grace and courtesy. Everything is back to We have to teach the children how to have positive relationships, especially if you're in a school like mine, where they're not coming from that paradigm. They're coming from a different situation at home, so you have to really teach them exactly what does it mean to be kind to somebody. How do you physically enact the tiny little steps that, that means? So here we are with the observant mind again. And we learn by absorbing. I love this. Don't you love this picture of the queen? Look at those knees. Does anybody hear something like that with those knees? But look at the boy. His knees, he's got his knees closed. They're absorbing it straight from us, right? And it's nature by nurture. You see this? This is a DNA helix. I just had this was on my midterm the other night. Stuff makes me crazy. Right? So here are these really great scientists all talking about it, looking at it. So you all know the debate, nature versus nurture, right? Well, there's pretty much an answer to that. It's nature via nurture. We'll have what we start with, right? And then it can go anywhere, anywhere. And you can even make dramatic improvements in what you start with, because you can build new bridges to get around some little gaps or holes you might have in your own original architecture, OK? So that's plasticity. So first of all, you can be optimistic because even your little child who you know, somebody, stand up if you have students who have some really organic issues. Maybe they were in utero with some trouble in utero or anything like that. Anybody in this room have experience with that? Well, not students, but people you know. Yeah, thank you. So you, those children will need extra help because they'll need to build bridges around the holes that are in their, their neural architecture. But the good news is that they can, okay? Even we can, even at this age, our brain, or older, our brain can change and improve and get around and stuff that we've been working with. So it's cool. So in that is what Montessori called adaptation, okay? We're always changing. We start, it, isn't that a great nebula? Our potential begins as a nebula. It's anything, it can be anything, but you've only got the substances that are in there to start with. 
But then the experience that we have in our life is what creates the pathways. Now those are all nerves. This is an actual picture of nerves. They have this great technique called the, the, oh my God, diffusion tensor imaging. And they can show a picture of all the nerves in the brain. It's what can call. It's what can call. And it, that's what creates the pathways, okay? This actual experience. So this is pruning. Anybody heard of neuronal pruning before? Some people. So what happens is you start, well, not in your way, is this is a little one-month-old brain, and this poor little boy, he died early. And so did this, this, this little guy did too. Um, these are two different parts of the brain on each of them. And you can see here that there's not as many neurons. These are each neurons. Right? The round part is the, nerve, the nucleus, which is called the soma. And then this, the lines going around are um, dendrites and axons. The long ones are axons. And you can see there's a lot more in the six-year-old brain than there are in the whole brain. Right? There's actually too many. Too many. So when we start, we have them. But you, if you look, you can see there's actually, you don't see so many more neurons over here, but you see more dendrites and axons. You see more lines. Those are the connections. Those are what we call the nerves, right? So the wiring is what increases as we get older. Not so many, not so much that we're making new neurons, but we're making new rows and connect the neurons, all right? But we have too many. So here's the babies, those neurons in the baby's brain. This is the six, seven-year-old brain. And then this is a 14-year-old brain. Do you see there's more space between those connections in the 14-year-old brain? That's what they call pruning. So we use, you get them like your brain goes crazy, making neurons, making neurons, making, uh, not making neurons, making uh, axons, dendrites, axons, connections, 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 and you get too many connections. And then it's the experience that we have that gets rid of the old ones because the ones that aren't used, they just kind of get absorbed by the body. So what we don't use, we lose, literally. Use it or lose it. That's really what happens in the brain. So that's why our experience is so important. So here you go. Here you got your little tree. Anybody got a gardener in the room? Any gardeners? You got, we got a few. We got this tree with too much, and it won't grow as well. You won't get as much fruit as you get off the one that's well fruit. It has to be fruit back. And that's through experience that we do it. Direct learning. Applying knowledge. Here's this little guy. Is anybody panicking? No, we're all on screens. Right? We're not panicking. Really. It's okay. It's just a soft thing here. It's going to be okay. You have to apply. You have to apply your knowledge. That's, that's for this kind of learning. But there's also the indirect learning, the absorbent mind learning, right? There's both. There's both. Every unnecessary aid is an optical obstacle to development. You guys know this, right? Have you tattooed it to your soul? Tattoo it to your soul. Tie your hands behind your back sometimes? I need to do that. Because what happens when we're not? We're cutting the wrong branches, OK? you got to let the child develop his neural, neural pathways. It's his work or hers. Now, this doesn't mean we don't offer help when they need it, right? That's the fine line. Sometimes we see ourselves going to extremes, more so probably with our own children than <laughs> our students. But we still offer help. We all need help sometimes. And some of us, we learn how to accept help sometimes. That's been a challenge for me. I'm working on that, accepting gratitude. OK, here's a great story of kind of Help versus an obstacle. So he was walking, right? He's walking on the street, and there are beggars. In India is so full of beggars. And the beggar approached him and asked him for, for money. Not that Gandhi had much money. And Gandhi looked at him, and he was so sorry to see him in that situation. And you could just, the person with this is soft, like his heart just opened up. But he looked at him and he said, I can't rob you of your right to independence. <laughs> I can't rob you of your right to independence. Now we know Monsoir was friends with Gandhi, right? They were contemporaries. It's quite simple, huh? So you can be compassionate by allowing independence. They're not exclusive, right? All right, so here's some ways that other people, not us, definitely not us, <coughs> but you might see other people in your class, in your school, do this, like leaving the classroom. You would never do this. Right? That doesn't happen in your classrooms. No. Right? 
<laughs> so this, this is important, huh? The most important time, the most important period of life is not the age of university studies, but the first one, the period from birth to age six. Look at this, look at this little mirror neuron going on here. Is that gorgeous or what? But our behavior directly affects the formation of their neural pathways.
Because the environment matters. Where you learn it, with whom you learn it matters. So just, just watch this for a second. Here. Well, hopefully this will work. You have sound.